You know, everyone pretends that all the people working in the tech industry are like cat girls or whatever, but in reality, um, most computer science, uh, f the field is, is very male dominated and not filled with um, the most uh, socially acclaimed people. You know, yeah, I don't know if they're gay. I think they're mostly just racist. <laughs> there are a lot of furries. Yeah, most of the furries that you've seen online are from the queer community. The straight furries that you meet are all racist, and they're all uh, computer science majors. It used to have a lot of women. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. Uh, initially, the development of computers and computer science as a field was about 50-50 men and women. Uh, but when computers started reaching the commercial market and being sold as toys and, you know, like entertainment devices to people, they were primarily marketed as like a guy, nerdy tech hobby thing, the way like cars were or or games were, you know, more of a guy thing. So because people got raised on computers being thought of as a guy thing, guys were more interested in computers growing up and then went on to get into computer science more. And there was a skew towards the, you know, a male... Um, uh, uh, you know, bias in, in the actual field, which kind of like reaffirms the, the bias, you know, it recreates the bias because now the guys that are working in the field are more likely to carry that bias and how they market and, you know, do stuff. It's freaky how that manifested. Yeah. Uh, cause for the longest time, it was mostly considered women's work to do any kind of computational stuff back when their yeah, back when their job was literally computer. That used to be the title of a job. Like you would, you would be there at a desk and you would have like, um, like a calculator and you would compute and that was considered women's work. But nowadays we would think of that as like a cool guy thing. Like, oh man, you're like a dune mentat. You sit down there and you use your giant brain to do math. That's like a guy thing. So much of the, you know, a, a lot, many of the biases, the gender biases we have, like the ideas, what we have, what men or women ought to do are really recent, like within our lifetime, basically very, very recent, uh, which is pretty wild to think about because a lot of people tend to think that a lot of these stereotypes go back like, oh, well, you know, centuries ago, we have these stereotypes about cooking or cleaning. And yeah, a lot of them do go back really far, but a ton of them literally just go back to like 1952. <laughs> like, a, like, a, like the modern nuclear family is less than a century old. A lot of these ideas came about back during a time where like, like people are still alive from before that was even a thing, really. Um, and, and it was a computer thing. I mean, that's very recent. I mean, that's just barely out of my lifetime. I was born in 94. So that would have been like mid 80s that that shift started to take place as computers started to be something that like commercially you could access, though, of course, back then it would have been very expensive. I mean, it still is, I guess, but not like computers used to be very big and very expensive. My grandfather was into computers back when they were like virtual. My grandfather was like a commander in the Navy, uh, pretty high up. Um, so his pension is. Um, is uh, substantial. And as a consequence of that, after he retired, which was a while ago, he's like 95 now, uh, he got into computers, like deconstructing them, building them. And the computers that he got back then were like the the old computer, like, let me see if I can, what, hold on, computer 1990. Let me see if I recognize this from like his basement, I guess. No, it was older than 1990. Let me see what they looked like back in like 86. Yeah, there we go. That looks about right. It would have been like, yeah, like this. I don't know much about the history of computers, but this is a pretty old computer. This would have been like the very beginning, man, like the very beginning. Um, and he was, you know, uh, uh, yeah. How, how much would this have cost? What, uh, what, what is this? Is this, um... What type of computer is this? I know one of you in chat can can tell me. An IBM PC? Is that what it's called? IBM PC 1986 cost. Introductory price was $2,000 back in 86, which would be about $5,000 today. He spent all of his retirement money on that. Uh, well, not retirement money, pension money. Sorry, different thing, I guess. Um, he was like, so that was like all, that was like his autism. It, Special interests just going into that, you know. Now a phone is more power than that. Now nowadays a phone has orders of magnitude more power than that, thousands of times more powerful than that. Yeah, um, enormous. People were loaded in the seventies, eighties. That's not really true. Some lucky people were, but that's that's what we remember culturally. You know what I mean? There's a reason why when people think of the seventeen hundreds and culture from the Renaissance period, everyone thinks of like you know 
Da Vinci and stuff. And it's like most of Renaissance culture was enjoyed by like the literal like one percent of one percent. Like we're literally talking about like the 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 like upper crust of Western European society, like a couple of Italian families, nobles, you know, like we're we're talking about like a very small portion, not even the bourgeoisie, because like I think one percent of Americans are technically a millionaire in terms of net assets. We're talking about less than one percent, but that's the culture that survives. You know, most of the culture from the majority of people back during the 1700s would have been like tavern music. Uh, oral history, poetry that like, you know, sort of like body rhymes, that kind of stuff. But we don't remember that. Histor history remembers, like it's documented, at least some of it, but nobody thinks about that when they think about the 1700s, right? Um, the only, the only uh, time that like proletarian culture really started getting factored into the way his historians like cataloged things, like really getting folded into the way we thought about those time periods was after the Industrial Revolution, because the Industrial Revolution brought poor people out of the uh, the farms and the serfdom and blah, blah, and brought them into factories. And it was around the time that one, photography started to be a thing. And two, um, there started to be more of an artistic movement towards painting common people. Um, I, I wish, I wish I could remember the, um, wh who, who was the painter who back in the 1800s got famous for painting like peasants toiling in a field? I wish I could, there's a specific painting that I'm thinking of. A lot of people are giving a lot of names. Unfortunately, I'm not going to remember just based off that. This is what I was thinking of, though. This? Oh, Millet. Thank you, Millet. Somebody in chat said Millet. You were the correct one. This is what I was thinking of. I mean, I guess a lot of you could be correct. But, like, for the longest time, the only people who could afford artists were, like, nobles, you know? So, um, wrong Millet, guys. Uh, the only people who could afford artists were nobles. So you would only get portraits of, like, barons and dukes and whatever. Um, but then uh, there was more of an interest in painting like common people. So you got stuff like this. And this was around the time where we started to factor in regular people, uh, when, when it came to like recording history, you know? Oh, oh, sure. There have been peasant artisans for sure, for sure. But those paintings don't get saved, you know? Um, it, there were talented painters who, who were never wealthy, but like their paintings didn't like, first of all, assuming they could even afford canvas, canvas used to be very expensive. Um, in all likelihood, they probably painted on wood. Uh, their paint was also substandard. A lot of it would just degrade with time. They probably didn't have access to higher quality varnishes or the practices that people used to preserve paintings because that was literally like a guild secret, you know? that was, Like, you couldn't Google that or whatever. That, like, that just, you didn't have that info. So the colors would fade, the paint would fade. A lot of these paintings just don't exist anymore. So the only things that get to be preserved through time and history are both the people with the money to be important and the people with the practices to preserve what they've done for you know, posterity. Um, yeah, a lot of culture has been lost. It's very unfortunate. Van Gogh was an example of that. He's lucky his works weren't destroyed. Though, in fairness, Van Gogh was after the Industrial Revolution, or at least through it, you know, more more recent than, like, pre... I, I'm thinking, like, more in the feudal days. But yeah, to an extent, like, he, he would... We are lucky that he got sort of um, vindicated post-mortem. Real... Uh, so it's me, me on a visit to uh, your mom's house. Uh, you know, real history right here.